Hello everybody, um, I am Nikita Kirane. So I believe this presentation is um, being viewed in different places uh, in the world that I've been told in Dubai, in Sa Singapore, in Australia, South Africa, in India and in all other places. So thank you so much for being with us, um, for taking your time out and being with us. I hope I give you some important and helpful information. So this is a slight introduction about myself um, that is Know Your Presenter. My name is Nikita Kirane. I am a speech and swallowing pathologist. I've done my master's from Nair Hospital, which is a government hospital in Mumbai in India. I've completed my licensing in, from the US and I'm a certified brain injury specialist. I consult in a couple of hospitals in Mumbai and I also have founded my own clinic which is also in Mumbai. Uh, some side information about me is that I love riding my bike, something interesting for you to know. Uh, my speciality is feeding and swallowing therapy. This is uh, the services that are provided at my clinic, which is speech and swallowing therapy, feeding therapy, occupational therapy, ABA therapy, hand rehabilitation, remedial therapy, and physiotherapy. That's our Instagram page. So you can follow us if you want more information about any of these. At my clinic, I particularly um, uh, practice feeding therapy and um, we have a lot of cases with feeding therapy and this is one of our effort to um, help you know people around the world if if you all have children or know someone who has a feeding problem so coming to the topic today that is autism and picky eaters facts and intervention interesting topic uh, so firstly, I would like to start by saying that feeding difficulties are seen in different pathologies and sometimes also when there is no pathology at all, that is even in normally developing children, we do see feeding problems. So feeding problems are seen across cerebral palsy, autism, cleft lip and palate, children with low tone and also children with congenital anomalies. In ICD classification, ICD-10, the code R63.3 uh, stands for feeding difficulties and usually in places where um, you get reimbursements for therapies, this code is used. Um, sometimes uh, parents find it difficult to find out, you know, what should be used for re reimbursements of our therapies and this is the code that you need to use. Uh, Indian viewers, unfortunately, we do not have any insurances in place which take care of feeding problems. Hopefully, we will be there soon. Okay, so coming to autism, uh, research says that around 70 to 89 percent of children with autism do show feeding difficulties. This is one of our child with feeding difficulties who is now he has uh, successfully overcome his difficulties and is now eating absolutely fine. So uh, the course of eating eating in a child with feeding difficulty is, is quite um, troubling for the parents and the family. It usually starts at, with the sight of food or at mealtime. So as soon as the child knows that it's mealtime, you know, or he sees food, all those symptoms start coming up. The usual symptoms that we see or parents complained of when they come uh, with their children are that my child starts crying when he sees food, he throws the plate, he throws the food, uh, he starts making excuses, he wants to play when it is meal time and all of that. So the child is trying to do everything in his capacity to just avoid the meal time. Then what happens is when the mother or the father or any of the parent uh, somehow manage to start feeding the child, there is absolute refusal to open the mouth. That is, there's just, you know, a zip mouth and the child will not open the mouth at, at all. Uh, or the child will gag at the sight of food. That is, as soon as the spoon is taken towards the child's mouth, the child will start coughing or gagging or the child will choke on the food or the child will pocket food. 
the next thing that happens is between meal times that is if somehow parents they do manage to still feed the child because after all you need to keep the child eating uh in between meal time what happens is the child will probably vomit everything out or there will be excessive crying excessive movement there will be on the go behavior that is the child doesn't sit in one place during meal time he's just running all over and usually the parents have to go around uh, behind the child you know just to feed the child this is one of the videos of of the child um, coming to our clinic he it's quite a classical video where every time the mom takes a spoon of food towards his mouth he ga- he coughs um this is a classic behavioral cough it is not that um the child has any cough and cold or uh, there is any other problem it is only when food is taken close to the child's mouth the child will cough sometimes if this is overdone then the child starts gagging so these are the problems or this or these are this is the course of eating of a of a child with feeding difficulties one thing that i haven't added over here is also that these children are uh, sometimes have problem with the touch of food that is if food drops on their hand anywhere or touches their cheeks or even the outer portion of their mouth then they do have a lot of sensory problems and they don't tolerate it and the first thing they will ask the mother or the father is clean it you need to clean it so that is also one of the sign and the symptom of a child with a feeding problem coming to meal time per day that is how many hours are invested into um meal time in children with feeding difficulties is usually um what i get to hear is you know um i take 1 hour i take 1 and a half hour sometimes parents also say that i take about 2 to 2 and a half hours to feed my child um which is quite some and that is just one meal so if we roughly count four meals per day that goes almost to four to six hours go into just feeding the child so the biggest question is if four to six hours go into feeding the child then there's hardly any time left to do any other activity it may be therapy it may be just normal activities like bathing going for to the playground to play going to school it can be anything but there is hardly any time left for any of these activities and because of that it gets more and more increasingly difficult for parents to deal with um the schedule of the child uh the third thing that we see is reduced food variety this is also a very common complaint and it's very troubling to the parent that you know they say that my child hardly eats about 4 to 6 items so i have hardly any option and then what happens is the mother is made to carry the tiffin to a birthday party to the relatives house to theaters for a vacation to a restaurant and also for unexpected emergencies so of course we all carry tiffins to places whenever we go out of home but these places usually we are expecting to eat at that place like a birthday party we are expecting to eat at the birthday party or a relatives house or a theater or a vacation or a restaurant so um unfortunately because these children do not accept any other kind of food um the parents have to usually make small tiffins for the child you know with either mashed food or or whatever the child accepts and they have to literally carry these tiffins around with themselves everywhere they go so that they can feed the child there is also um sometimes you know that parents say that you know we went shopping yesterday and that there was really nice ice cream over there but my child doesn't eat ice cream and then i felt so weird to eat ice cream when my child is not eating so even i decided not to eat then we also get this that you know at a birthday party you know children his age were eating but my child wasn't eating so it's really uncomfortable for me i'm i'm so troubled we also had a few parents who actually planned tiffins for unexpected emergencies of course we are not expecting emergencies but they they had that tiffin in their bag that in case anything goes wrong i am so sure that my child will not eat anything which is available outside and so i need to carry a tiffin 
and this does get more and more stressful for the parents the fourth thing that we have seen in in um, parents or families with feeding problems is increased family tension now what happens is always we all know that no no our, all our five fingers are not the same no two people are the same and of course in in parents there is one parent who is always stronger than the other parent usually in indian scenario what we see is the mother is expected to feed the child and um when the child doesn't eat there is there is a blame game that starts or there is you know increased tension that oh you don't know how to feed the child the child is eating everything but you are not feeding him right or you know instances like this do come up when almost 4 to 6 hours go into just crying and stressful feeding so there are these kind of problems also that happen which just bring the overall quality of life of the family down because of these feeding problems so with all these problems happening together the solution starts looking very very far away it just starts looking blurred and parents don't know what to do the the solution for this is feeding therapy and who will do feeding therapy it's a speech language pathologist who usually does feeding therapy um all speech lang- language pathologists are not trained to do feeding therapy so you need to see whether your particular slp does feeding therapy or not uh since i am a speech language pathologist and i belong i uh, belong to india i can vouch that in india there is a lot of awareness within our community as well and more and more therapists are trying to specialize in this field to cater to more and more patients so you need to see if uh, your slp um, practices feeding therapy or not so what is feeding evaluation all about so if i have to break it down in simple terms um different parts of our body have a different sensory curve that is someone may like uh, like it to be touched on their cheek but someone else may not and so on different parts of the body have different sensory um uh, expectations so uh, in these children what happens is the oral sensory par- uh, system they are the oral sensory system it is either hypersensitive or it is hyposensitive so the graph is hyper normal and hypo when i say hypersensitive it means that even a slight touch on the cheek may feel like you know really slapping uh, like the pressure is actually hard like slapping the child so the child has a problem with even a slight touch on the cheek hyposensitive is even if i press very hard the child does not really sense it and uh, so the sensation in those areas are, is very less so um, the interesting thing is that uh, in the oral cavity there can be parts who uh, which are hypersensitive and there can be other parts which are hyposensitive what i mean by that is the uh, ones that are listed in front of you are the parts of the oral cavity that is the tongue the lips the inner cheeks outer cheeks the teeth and the palate so it is quite possible that the the tongue is hypersensitive but the cheeks are hyposensitive so these things happen in feeding which makes it increasingly difficult for the child to understand what kind of food i want that is why some parents also say that you know one day he will eat this the next day if i give him the same thing he will not eat it so that also happens there are also children who have a overall hypersensitive oral cavity or a overall hyposensitive oral cavity so we have different variations different profiles and that is exactly what is evaluated in a feeding evaluation next what is done is in feeding therapy there are different approaches the ones that i usually use is sos approach and behavioral pattern approach i feel that it works the best and it gives a a very good success rate in children but what you need to understand is there are a lot of different approaches in feeding therapy and your therapist may use one or combine two or two or three um to cater to your child's needs because it all depends on what the oral sense uh, oral system is asking for now there are different tools that you must be seeing around in your um, speech therapy sessions or you must have seen anywhere else so there are tools that are used for feeding therapy 
the two most commonly used tools are the ones that are seen on the screen that is the z wipe brush which is this one which is in uh, beautiful different colors and this is the chewy tube which is uh, color coded it's uh, different textures across different colors so these are the two most commonly used tools there are a lot of other tools that are available and are used for feeding therapy uh, again it depends on what your child needs and likewise your therapist will be using that tool so any of the therapy that is done it is combined with play therapy that is if i do sos technique then it is combined with play if i do behavioral pattern approach i it is combined with play so all the techniques are combined with play and what is the motive of doing all of this to to slowly start aligning the sensory system that is if it is hyposensitive get it back to normal if it is hypo get it back to normal if it is varied again get it back to normal so to start aligning the um, oral sensory system so that the child starts accepting food now um i would also like to put it over here that sometimes um feeding therapy sessions are not as um you know happy sessions as speech therapy sessions because you are putting the child in an uncomfortable zone and the child may cry the child may show a, a little um uncomfortable behaviors because of course he is not comfortable um when you are um tapping him in those areas which are hyposensitive or hypersensitive so it is not that um a happy session in the beginning but yes it definitely starts um getting really nice and the child starts eating all kinds of different food and uh, both the parents and the child they are they are extremely happy and slowly it starts falling in place yeah so this is a question that i get a lot of times that does this even work and the answer is yes 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 it does work it works with almost all children and i don't think i have had even one case which has gone uh, back without eating there have all the cases they do start eating and um, most of the cases who we who we get in the beginning are eating either um, one uh, either two or three or four items only or they are just fixed to semi thick consistency or puree consistency or very hard um, biscuits or something like that but yes they do start eating this is again a very uh, a small child um, who was not even touching food and now he is um he was on a vacation and he is um exploring and eating the biscuit so parents are really happy and you can see that the video is taken from the rear mirror of a car so because it was the first time that he picked the biscuit himself and started eating so yes feeding therapy does work and uh please try it if your child or if you know of anyone uh, who has a feeding problem um also another question that i get is what happens if i don't do feeding therapy what happens if i just let him eat what he wants to eat usually it um this question is is asked by that parent who cannot see their child go through feeding therapy because their child might cry in the first two three sessions so you know they say forget it i don't want to do it what happens if i don't do it so what happens is that because the nutrition that you are taking is usually of one type first thing that happens is your gastrointestinal strength goes down that means that our system uh, our digestive system it is made in such a way that it needs to accept different kind of food so that different kind of electrolytes are accepted which uh which will um encourage growth so that's the first thing that happens i think i'm not i have not put these points in the right order but i can tell you in the right order so the second thing that will happen is imbalance of the electrolytes of the nutrition of the vitamins of all the other um components of the digestive system because of which what will happen is the physical growth and the brain growth is affected and there is nutritional imbalance um because of the nutritional imbalance the child is hungry all the time or he, his stomach is not really full and that is why you know you you see the child crying a lot of times because 
of course he's hungry he wants food but he is not able to eat it and because of that it affects emotional growth because then the child is just irritable he is not sitting in one place he is hyperactive there are all other issues that that happen because of um this problem so i think indians are very familiar with it ki pehle pet puja fir kaam dooja that's how it is that is um pe- you need to first fill your tummy and then you can do whatever work you have to do so um that's basically what happens if you don't do feeding therapy or um if i have to Uh, put it in a better line if you just leave the child uh, and let him eat whatever he wants to eat which happens to skip fruits skip vegetables skip a lot of other um, food items all right so that was my presentation this is also another child with feeding therapy who we successfully could um, uh, handle um, i hope to see you all around thank you very much for listening to my presentation that's uh, our contact number please feel free to ask any questions any doubts any help we are more than happy to help that's our instagram page we are uh, mostly going to hold a workshop so people in bombay or who want to come for the workshop who can travel to bombay in the near future we'll be putting it up on on our instagram page the workshop is going to be exclusively on feeding so you can definitely join us over there if not we do keep putting posts and um, other things other techniques um, or any instrument or any tools that will work uh, for your child for feeding problems we do put it on on our in-